Everything is connected, and there is a deep and profound beauty within those connections. From the vast realm of the astronomic far over our heads, and between the links of the microscopic organisms that we know and see all around us. And also, if we dive deep to the realm beyond sight, the realm of the microscopic, we find there again that everything is connected. In this little jar, I have gathered a bit of the bio-slime, algal growth, plants and stones from the base of this remote river, and in it created a fascinating mesocosm. I have left it in a cool place where it can have access to the sun for about half the day, and within it, a self-sustaining microcosm of connections and ecology has developed, and it is beautiful. So beautiful and so deep and profound in its connections that I have decided to devote a full branch of the understory channel to the study of the wonders and the connections within the realm of the microscopic. Welcome to MicroStory, the tale of the invisible world all around us. Over the past year I have built, or rather rebuilt, a unique light microscope with unusual lighting capabilities, or perhaps I should say techniques and optical qualities that I have selected for their particular ability to present to us the beauty of that microscopic world. As we go forward, we will take the time to study a great deal of that beautiful microscopic world. But for the moment, we will focus upon the awe-inspiring sights, wonders, and deep connections to be found within that little microcosm. That tiny two-liter jar of water, sand, silt, and life that I collected in that remote woodland river and left to develop into its own little universe. It's amazing, but every time I peek into that jar, I find something new. There is a vast realm of biodiversity even there. It tells me above all that life is diverse and ingenious. And just as we can see in that glowing emerald clusterium above right center, floating there as if in the blackness of space among algae and freshwater diatoms, life is a wonder. But life is also vast, and there is so much of it to explore. So much, in fact, we are never going to get through all of it. I don't think that even in the span of the next few episodes in which we will focus upon this little mesocosm, that we will even be able to come close to getting through all the biodiversity just within that little jar. To be quite honest, I cannot even get through all the biodiversity that I find within a single drop taken from that jar. So today, let's focus upon this little one-celled creature, this beautiful freshwater diatom called Clostarium. Illuminated from the side, we begin to see some of the dimensions within Clostarium. I think that's important. Microscopes have a way of making us feel like the microscopic world is two-dimensional in a sense, because we are fundamentally restricted to looking straight down at it and I've been looking for ways to fill it out, show it as more full. I mean, it can be done with many very expensive microscopes, but I don't have that kind of budget. So I work with rearranging light, and when we rearrange that light and get very close to a clusterium, we see it has a clear point at either end of its banana-shaped tips, little vacuoles filled with tiny particles, so small that to really see them well, magnification must be at least 600 power, and here we are looking at them at 800. These little crystals bounce about endlessly within their vacuoles, always in motion through a phenomenon called Brownian motion, a topic we will look at in another video. The crystals themselves are made of barium or calcium sulfate. And here's the thing, every clusterium has them, but to this day, no one knows what they do. In an article of the typical dryly scientific name, Barium accumulation by the Desmids of the genus Clusterium, which appeared online around 2007. It is noted in particular that these barium sulfate crystals may perform one of two functions. They might play some role in excretion, or, probably more likely, they play the role of stratolus. Stratolus are structures within a cell that help it orient itself in space, put simply to tell if it is level or going up or down. It is also interesting to note that the crystals, sometimes as much as 50 per vacuole, are not attached to anything. They simply float about within their vacuoles, bouncing around due to the action of Brownian motion, which 
In short, is caused at this scale by atoms smacking into one another randomly, kind of like billiard balls, as a result of temperature. Stratolus and Clusterium could be especially useful as the Clusterium is one of the most motile, or in other words, mobile, of the planktons. This one seems relatively content to sit in place, which may be simply because it is pinned between the narrow space of the slide and cover slip. Certainly, if you noticed its size compared to the other plankton and microorganisms around it, the Clusterium is huge, at least on the microscopic scale. Ultimately, Clusterium is a desmid, a relatively common form of algae that live in fresh and salt water that are noteworthy for their beautiful shapes and symmetry. Clusteriums, by and large, are lunate, shaped like a crescent moon like this one, but their other desmid cousins come in a variety of shapes, all presenting an amazing and beautiful, often complex symmetry. This one, which I also found in my little mesocosm, I believe to be a cosmarium, but I haven't yet taken the time to fully identify it. And this desmid is called microsterios. They can be plain, or they can be exceedingly complex in shape, but they are all beautiful. Desmids also have in common that they are the base of the food chain, a plankton, and an algae they are at the very first step of transforming micronutrients into food. And in that sense, every living thing is linked to them. Tiny crustaceans eat them, and they in turn are eaten by small fish, which in turn are eaten by larger fish, which in turn are eaten by birds and mammals, and ultimately perhaps you. Thus, we are all linked through the food web. But I think it's also fascinating that this creature contains chlorophyll like a plant, and yet it moves around. It is motile, and, having entered the field of psychology many years ago with the express purpose of understanding the mind of nature, I often find myself looking at small creatures such as this and wondering just what are their motivations. Such a small creature must have a simple mind, but when you think about it, the human brain is comprised of about 83 billion neurons which, individually, probably aren't much more intelligent than desmids, which is to say organisms such as these clusteria but link neurons through synaptic connections, bathe them in chemicals such as neurotransmitters, and supply them with electricity, and the marvel of a human mind emerges. And I consider how only three decades ago, we had no idea that those tiny fungal fibers in the soil, in every forest, and in many meadows, linked all the plants together to create yet another kind of intelligence. And so, I look at these beautiful clusteria and think, we know they play a key role in the food web. Do they also play a role in nature's mind? Thank you for joining me on this first episode of Micro Story. Today's episode was merely the first step into the enormous and fascinating world of the tiny creatures that dwell all around us, yet are literally so small that they are invisible. These organisms, oft neglected, were the first life to appear upon this world and are the foundation of all life, past and present. They shape our planet, our lives depend upon them, and, as we shall see, weave together to make something greater than the sum of their parts. Thank you for joining on this voyage of discovery into the Micro Story. The Micro Story channel is part of the Understory Network, a series of channels promoting education about natural science, and the conservation of the beautiful world that surrounds us. Small but growing channels, they are made possible by our many viewers, patrons, and those persons and businesses that have helped us acquire the resources and equipment necessary to produce high quality programming. If you enjoyed today's program, please take a moment to like, and also take a moment to subscribe. It costs nothing and never will, but it sure helps. And keep watch here and on our sister channels for future episodes.